What's up, Giants fans, and welcome to a special edition rounding third and king as we have ourselves a little bit of a of a round table here with uh, two of my favorite guys here on the Giants um, weekend programming, if you will. On my left, the great Bill Lasky. You hear him all the time on extra innings after Giants games, the post game show. And then to my virtual right is <laughs> Mr. Kerry Crowley, uh, my platoon partner for the Giants warm up show. And obviously, you can hear Kerry all the time uh, during the season and um, and just on KMBR on on Sports Phone KMBR. So welcome to Rounding Third and King, the special edition. I'm really excited to kind of break down the 2024 season and project forward because we had a lot of news happen, but really excited to have you guys uh, here on the podcast today. Well, we were pretty, I know Carrie and I both appreciate jumping on with you, Walter. I mean, we usually host, but now you're the host, so we can be the <laughs> guest and you get to ask us all the tough questions, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, Walter. Yeah, really looking forward to this, Walter. And like Bill said, uh, you get to throw us some curveballs here, and we'll see. Bill was a pitcher, so he knows a little thing or two about <laughs> curveballs. Uh, I didn't get very far in the game of baseball. So <laughs> I'm probably not going to be uh, swinging for the fences here. No, yeah, man. It, it'll be a lot of fun, and we've had a lot of uh, of news early at this point after the Giants concluded their season. Another uh, losing season finished uh, below 500. Another one with Farhan. Farhan is out. And now Buster Posey it was named president of baseball operations for the San Francisco Giants. Just want to get your guys' initial thoughts of, we kind of already knew that Farhan was on his way out, uh, but Buster Posey being named as president of baseball operations. Bill, what, what was your initial reaction to that? Well, I was surprised, like most Giants yeah. fans, but excited also. I think uh, everybody's excited as we've seen what kind of player he is and then stepping into an ownership part. And now he's going to be president of baseball operations. And of course, a lot of people skeptical because he's never done it before, but I loved what he said. I'm going to circle myself with baseball people and they're going to, you know, one thing I love about Buster, he listens more than he speaks. And then when he speaks, everybody listens. One of the things he said in that press conference and going back to old school, I loved it when he talked about analytics he said, well, we're going to keep analytics, but we're also going to use our eyes and our heart. And that's old school stuff. And that's what I loved about it. And I know that's the first step that we've seen out of him. And there's a lot more steps he's going to throw at us. Yeah, I'm really fascinated, Bill, to see where this evolves, because you brought up the most important point here, and that is Buster has to listen, and they found the perfect listener. When I was around this team, 2017 to 2021, as a beat reporter, one of the things that always struck me was how selective Buster would be with the times that he would speak up. You could tell 2017, 2018, 2019, all of those seasons weighed on him. The amount the Giants lost, the way they played the game, it really forced him to recalibrate and recalibrate his expectations, reconsider what was possible for each season. But when he picked his spots to speak up, he made sure he did so after taking in the opinions of others, after assessing a bigger picture in terms of the situation the Giants were in. And I think that's exactly what he's done this season. I think that he stepped in as part of the board, part of the ownership group, and he's done a lot of listening. He's done a lot of learning. And now it's who does Buster hire? Who does he surround himself with? And I think you brought up the great point. It's the scouts. It's the folks who are going to be in the front office. Those are going to be the people who ultimately determine the Giants' success. And I think the next month is just as important as the next year for Buster Posey because the people who he hires as a general manager, as directors of scouting, as different levels of the front office, these are going to be the folks that shape the future of the organization. All in Buster's vision, of course, but it's going to be who he listens to who shapes the next era of Giants baseball. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, well said there, Kerry. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, just who Buster does surround himself with. And and uh, in the press conference, and we also had him on with Papa and Lund uh, immediately following the press conference, he said that his, his first job uh, his first, I guess, priority would be to bring in a GM. And and there's been a lot of speculation of, well, would it be Brian Sabian? Would it be someone from the past? Or would it be someone, you know, moving forward into the future? One of these younger assistant GMs around uh, baseball. I know John Morosi put out a tweet earlier today, uh, and he, he mentioned Scott Sharp of the uh, Kansas City Royals as being a potential candidate. And then obviously Billy Owens across the bay with the, with the Oakland Athletics just – where do you guys see it going? I mean, would you see Buster kind of going back to the well in 
a blast from the past? Like, would we see guys that we've seen before, or is it kind of progressing into the future with analytics being such a big part of it? Uh, how do you guys see it playing out? Go ahead, Kerr. Yeah, I think that it's a fascinating dynamic here, Walter, because there is a great candidate sitting across the bay who doesn't want to move to Sacramento or Las Vegas and Billy Owens. So when the Giants actually fired Bobby Evans back in 2018, I wrote for the Mercury News, the Giants ought to hire Billy Owens as their president of baseball operations. That's how strong of a baseball man I see this guy as. He's great to talk to. He's a dynamic scout. You look at the talent that's come through the Oakland A's organization. For the money that they've spent in the last two decades, they've outperformed expectations. And I know that there's been a lot of losing in that organization, but there've also been a lot of great players to come through. Billy Owens has had a hand in that. I saw another name that came up that really interested me as well, Bill, and that's Nick Hundley, who did a lot of catching for the Giants back as a backup to Buster Posey. I think Tim Kawakami put this out there that you know Nick Hundley's name was brought up at the press conference, and he's someone who's worked in a higher capacity in Major League Baseball in the commissioner's office. He's someone who definitely sees the game through a similar lens. And right now the Giants are seeing another backup catcher in Steven Vogt make it in the playoffs as a manager with the Cleveland Guardians. And I love the catcher's perspective. You see the whole field as a player. You see the bigger picture in the clubhouse. And I think having someone with catching experience in the front office would be a real asset to the Giants. So someone who's played a variety of roles in their career already, someone who's also played some Major League Baseball, you love that. Bill, I think it's just imperative that they bring in a true baseball man who lives and breathes the game and not someone, look, I, I love the folks who who come to the game with a different perspective. I am one of them. I didn't play at the highest level, but for this job, I think you bring in someone who played Major League Baseball and has that experience in the clubhouse, like the 49ers did when they hired John Lynch. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's what Buster's going to do. Somebody that he can communicate with. I love what he said. It's going to be the stepping stone. He's going to do a lot of the hard work, and he wanted scouting. I think that's a main thing when you look at free agents, building a, a new team, building you know for trades. And I really think when you start looking at minor leagues, that's another big thing yeah. that we've seen the minor leagues just fall back. And sure, there's a handful of good prospects, but when you look at Brian Sabian – and you look at uh, Bear and a lot of the other ones that he had, those are scouting people. Those are the people that were in the trenches. That's what Buster Posey wants. He wants those guys. And they're, you know, just like I said, the eyes and the heartbeat, that's where you find out if you got a good player. It's not all about analytics. And analytics will be a part of it. Numbers are always going to be improving or going backwards. But I think it really comes down to the heart of the player and how much he wants to play. He talked about Matt Chapman being a gamer, a player. Those are the guys I think he's going to want to get in on his roster. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and when you look at uh, just just having guys with a like mind and, and just going back to the players mentality, I think that would be huge uh, for the direction of this Giants organization because this is a, a a trying time. I mean, this is a pivotal point in this Giants organization uh, right now that they have to go in a direction that uh, that knows. Giants baseball for, for winning. And what that was, was pitching and defense and, and Buster Posey. That's that's, that was one of his main points in his press conference. And in talking to pa Papa and Lund earlier this week was to get back to kind of the basics of mm -hmm. the, what works in San Francisco, what works at Oracle park. It is pitching and defense. So uh, you hear him talking about getting back to the the Matt Canes. You hear him talking about getting back to the to, the Tim Lincecums and the Mad Bums. So there could be a real uh, culture change, if you will, or a true direction knowing uh, where the Giants are going to go heading forward. But prioritizing pitching and defense, I mean, that has to be music to all Giants fans' ears uh, when you hear that, especially from your three-time champion, Buster Posey. I'll, I'll tell you something real quick. Bill, I listened to a lot of extra innings this year. And uh, one of the things that caught my ear on a pretty consistent basis was you're pretty forgiving of a major league player. You understand how hard it is to get to that level, but the mental errors eat you up. The mental errors are tough for you to handle as a former pitcher when your defense doesn't come through, when the defense doesn't rotate on bunts, when guys run into each other in the field like you had Tyler Fitzgerald, Marco Luciano happening in San Diego earlier this season. My guess is during the Buster Posey era, Extra innings is going to feature a few <laughs> less mental errors and a few less frustration with that type of a mistake, you know? 
Well, you know, we always go back to 10, 12, and 14, pitching and defense. That's a big thing. And there was Buster all three times. So that is going to be a big mark. And I think Bob Melvin even says it a lot when he talks about the errors. And you talk and carry mental errors doesn't come up. When you look at the Giants in 2024, 87 errors, 14th in Major League Baseball, they did clean it up. But I guarantee there's probably another 87 mental errors mm-hmm. of not covering the base or throwing the wrong way or not hitting a cutoff. And then next to that 90 feet gets added into it. He's going to clean that up. There's no question about it. And I love what Walter said, two catchers, Bob Melvin and Buster Posey, two catchers. I think catchers are huge here. And I'm going to throw another name that could be out there is Mike Matheny. Mike Matheny may be adding in here too. Yeah. Another Willie Mack award winner. Loves Buster, talks to Buster a lot. You know what? We might have a whole front office of catchers, but that's okay by me. Catchers are the best. Hey, my battery mate was a catcher. I'm all for it. I love it. Yeah, they definitely uh, see the game uh, differently, right? I mean, when you look at some of the mm-hmm. most successful managers in baseball, a lot of them were catchers. So, I mean, mm-hmm. they're they're arguably one of the smartest uh, guys out there. No, 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 uh, no, what? no disrespect. No disrespect. <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> I'm just saying, like but you aren't even right handers. <laughs> that's, that's who I like. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we are live on rounding third and King on KMBR, the sports leader. And I am joined by Bill Lasky of extra innings and Carrie Crowley. You hear him all the time on KMBR airwaves and uh, does a good job on the weekends as well during the Giants season. So uh, we will talk about the off season later because there is a lot of pressing needs, right? They're, they're the Giants uh, talk about pitching, talk about defense, the offense does need to be addressed at some point, whether that is a trade, whether that's uh, going out and acquiring a big bat this off season, we will get to, uh, to some of that, but do you, do you guys think just on the, on the lens of, and I'll start with you, Carrie on the lens of Buster Posey now being at the helm, th- does that change the perception of attracting free agent hitters or just free agents in general to where we saw the regime of Farhan Zaidi and, and, there was a, 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 it was a struggle to, to get guys to come here and to commit to playing in San Francisco long term. So do you think that that perception changes with Buster Posey at the helm? I'd call this the million dollar question, but in reality, Walter, I think this is a billion dollar question for the San Francisco Giants because of the way that the finances in Major League Baseball look right now. I think that Buster helps them get a meeting with just about anyone they want to get a meeting with. I think when Juan Soto hits the market this offseason, if Buster gives him a call, if Buster gives Scott Boris a call, they will sit down and they'll get the meeting. The difference is, is Buster a closer? Because I think that we saw during the Farhan Zaidi era that they really struggled to close on the big free agents, whether it was offering Shohei Otani money that he couldn't turn down. The Giants decided not to do that. Whether it was offering Aaron Judge $100 million more than anyone else, the Giants decided they couldn't do that. The same is true of Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who they went after, and a dozen other free agents who they tried to land. I think that we're going to learn a lot because, to be quite honest, during Buster's career, He was also part of a lot of these recruiting pitches, Bill, and he didn't always finish the job, but he got them in the room. And I think it's different because he's a player in those circumstances, 15, 16, 17, when he's out there on the trail with Brian Sabedy and Bobby Evans trying to get folks to come to San Francisco. A player's perspective is different than someone who's close to what he's not close to ownership. He is ownership. He's ownership and a president of baseball operations. Buster Posey's a winner. Now we get to see if he's a closer. And I think that is maybe the most fascinating element of this entire saga here, Bill. You know, one thing Walter said is we'll look at what they need. And I think that's one of the biggest things because there's more than one or two players. If it was a Blake Snell and we need a starting pitcher, go after him. But there's so many needs on this team and we've seen it all year and second base and shortstop come up immediately. You want to build in the middle of the diamond. And those two are needs that, You saw a lot of rookies do, a lot of first-time players do, and they did show some balance, maybe a little better than what you thought, but I still like stability in the middle as a second baseman and a shortstop. Jung-Hoo Lee, of course, will take center field, and we look at the middle of the diamond carry, and Walter, we talk about it all the time. That's where the defense starts, Mm -hmm. and you got a great third baseman, so you have to go out and get more than one piece, and I think that's going to stabilize what Buster wants to do right there. Yeah. yeah, and it'll be it'll be really interesting, Kerry, because you talked about him being a closer, and we talk about who's going to be manning the hot corner for the next six seasons, and that's Matt Chapman, right? And he was part of uh, those negotiations in 
finalizing and and making sure that Matt Chapman was here and in a fixture and a focal point for this Giants team moving forward. Um, but okay, let, let's we'll continue the the off season talk a little bit later. Uh, free agents is a is a big part of it. It, it is a big part of it in in building a uh, a championship roster. But let's talk about now what what Buster Posey has to work with currently. Right. I mean, looking back on 2024, it did not go how the Giants organization, how Giants fans had hoped that the season would go. I know uh, I I don't know how all of your guys's predictions went, but mine was poorly. I I went 92 and 70. Didn't even sniff that. It wasn't even close (laughs) at any point, any juncture of the season. It was not uh, anywhere close. I I was I was getting a little excited when they were on that road trip, all those comeback wins against the Pirates and the and the Mets. But yeah, no, it wasn't anywhere near that. Um, But so let's look at looking at. 2024 that what the giants do currently have what buster posey has to uh to work with here moving forward who do you believe is has kind of from their season who do you believe has cemented themselves as being a focal point as being a a centerpiece or not necessarily a centerpiece but a piece of this team moving forward into 2025 and beyond carrie uh what do you say Yeah, I think it's difficult to determine exactly who's part of this because Buster could use a number of the players already in the organization as trade chips. I mean, you've got to make changes. And so I think that that's a difficult component. But I do think that they have a decent building block to work with over at third base and Matt Chapman. He's someone who you could foresee hitting third or fourth or fifth next season. He's someone who you know mans third base and does a extraordinary job playing defense. So he's a focal point right there. You've got Elliot Ramos, who I think will take down a corner outfield spot next season. You have to kind of pencil him in for 130, 140 games, give him an opportunity to build off of his rookie season. Jung Hu Lee coming back from the injured list. I think he's someone you absolutely want to take a look at in center field, probably hitting lead off. You anticipate that he'll be able to make that next step and adjust to major league pitching after this season where he was obviously out for the year with the shoulder injury after running into the center field wall. Then it becomes a little bit more difficult to project. Is Tyler Fitzgerald an everyday fixture on this team? Probably not a shortstop for me, but can he play a second base role? Can he play a utility role? I absolutely see that for him moving forward. Then you move to the rotation, Bill. I love Logan Webb. There's no question he's he's an ace in my mind. It's what they have behind him. I want to see Hayden Birdsong give you 150, 160 innings. I want to see Kyle Harrison show that he can regain some of that velocity that he had in the minor leagues. I'd love to see Harrison spend the offseason tinkering with that breaking ball of his because if he really finds a dynamic second pitch, I think he could be a middle-of-the-rotation guy for the Giants. Beyond that, Does Robbie Ray come back? Do they look to trade him? I think that he's someone who Buster inherited. He's not a long-term piece for the organization in the bullpen. You know, you've got Tyler Rogers and Ryan Walker, but how does Buster feel about Camilo Doval? It's very difficult for me to say who the long-term pieces are without knowing kind of any sort of a track record that Buster has in the front office. So I think last year we were able to say, oh, absolutely. Mike, Mike Yastrzemski will be here. Tyro Estrada will be here. Lamont Wade will be here a year later. It's completely different. So, Bill, who would you build around? I'm going to go exactly what you said, but I'll build a couple other pieces in here. You look at arbitration eligible players, and I think those are the numbers and names you're going to come up. And the first one is Mike Yastrzemski. Are you going to pay him over $10 million for another year? There's lapses in the beginning of the year with Mike Yastrzemski. At the end, he was fascinating in the month of September. Really hit the ball well. Then you look at Lamont Wade Jr. He's another one that's arbitration eligible. Are you going to bring him back in? What are you going to do with him if you do? He can't play outfield. His first base was okay. His hitting was, and he hit under 10 home runs. Then you got to look at Duvall, as we all talk about. Where is he going to fit in this bullpen? Walker did a great job. Ended up with a 1-9-1 earned run average, 10 saves, 10-4. and four. I think he cemented the closer role. Tyler Rogers, definitely you're going to bring him back. Over 70 games, fascinating. But I think you look at those arbitration players, there's only four of them, and I think I keep two and I get let two walk. I really do. I think you take your Strimsky and Rogers and maybe you could sign them. And like Walter and I say, sign them and then try to trade them. Yeah. Those are a couple of things, but you got to look at other guys. You know, we keep, we keep forgetting about Wilmer Flores. He's got yeah. an option to come back in. We do. You know, he's got another year that he's going to opt back in. And there's no question there. So maybe he gets packaged in a deal. There's some possibilities with so much pitching carry and Walter. We always talk about a lot of young arms that could possibly get in a trade 
And the other question we both we don't talk about is Patrick Bailey behind the plate. Yeah. You got Tom Murphy with four million coming back and he got twenty two at bats this year. Yeah. That was a bad signing. That was a real bad signing for a backup catcher when you had Kirk Caselli almost playing just as much or more with him. So I think the catching position with Buster Posey and Bob Melvin is a big question mark. Do you go out and get another quality catcher? So a lot of and if ors, but I think you start exactly what Kerry's saying. I think you build with a lot of the youth, and if you can add veteran leadership, it adds into a good roster. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, when you look at the the catcher position, and and being that it is Buster Posey and it is uh, Bob Melvin at at the at the manager position, I mean, you, you gotta you gotta wonder how they're going to maximize uh, Patrick Bailey because I do feel like he didn't he didn't really regress, but he didn't get better. I mean, it was kind of more of the same to where we're still trying to figure out if if Patrick Bailey can go the length of a season. One, obviously, he's not going to play 162, but you, you need him in there 115, 120. And then you have to have other catchers on the roster as well. And and yeah, they were decimated with with injuries and and what they do to, to kind of prolong uh, Patrick Bailey's seasons. It's going to be really interesting to see how they construct that as well. But I do want to, I do want to pick your brain, especially, especially you, Bill, um, with the pitchers, right? I mean, we talk a lot about pitching and defense for the San Francisco Giants moving forward. We know that that is the recipe for success. Uh, and, and it was in the past. It's going to be interesting to see if that, if that same formula can work in 2025 and moving into the, into the future here, especially with the ballpark that they play in. But when you look at guys like Kyle Harrison and, you know, he's, he's another guy that I, I wish that we were able to see a little bit more growth from him this year has to work on those off-speed pitches. Uh, but Hayden Birdsong was a great story to where I know a lot of people were talking about him at spring training and, and he was kind of in that conversation with Landon Roop and, and, uh, as, as far as being a, a part of a rotation moving forward, but just let's start with Kyle Harrison. Where, where do you think that he is in the development? And his, is he more seen from this organization? And in your eyes, do you see him still as a top of the rotation starter? Or is he kind of in the middle towards the 4-5 spot? I think the biggest question I'd like to ask Buster is, are we going to take the gloves off some of these guys yeah. and let him go a little longer mm -hmm. in the games and push him a little longer to get to 90 pitches to 100 pitches? Because the cutoff, it seems like it's 60, 70 pitches. And that's where you talk about growth. You're not growing from there. Right. And, and Birdsong did a little bit. I liked what he did the last game, even though he got in a little trouble. He still pitched well. And I loved him going out there the last game to give him one more push. You know, you got to look at Tristan Beck, another guy that really threw the ball well. And, of course, the aneurysm he had to deal with and the time off. There are some possibilities to fill this rotation. Harrison is one of them, no doubt. But I still think... He needs to grow a little bit more. Mm -hmm. He needs to go in depth in more of the games. I, I like him as a lefty, but I'm I'm saying he's a three, four. And then that's a good spot for him. If you can fill one, two, you got Webb. If you can feel if Robbie Ray comes back and he's healthy, that's a possibility as a two, three. But if you can put Harrison, Birdsong, Tristan Beck at that four, five, and then maybe you miss a start here and there when you get a day off, I think that's how you can gauge them. But I want them to go deeper in the games. I think the five innings cutoff point, that's where I think Buster Posey is going to change it. Yeah, very well said, Bill. And this all starts and should all change at the minor league level. We've seen mm -hmm. Kyle Harrison be developed as someone who comes in and he's throwing 60 pitches after the draft. We're seeing Hayden Birdsong throw 50 pitches in, in an outing. You don't grow. You know this better than anyone, Bill. You don't grow from 50 pitches. You're trying to max out. You're trying to strike everyone out. If you're given a leash of 100 to 110 and told to get 21 outs on a given day, mm -hmm. you're pitching to contact a little bit more. You're trying to hit your spots a little bit more. That's something that Buster Posey, you know, he's mentioned throughout his career. Guys who hit their spots, they work deeper into games. No better example of that than Logan Webb. And I really hated the philosophical shift that the Giants made over the last three, four seasons where minor league pitchers were not allowed to go past about 75 pitches in a ball game. That has to be different. The Giants have to buck that trend that's swept across the minor leagues. I don't think you learn at all. I mean, I, I grew up, I'm what, 30 years old? I grew up in an era when we were throwing 120 pitches out at West Sunset. So mm -hmm. come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the other thing too, Carrie and Walter, is when you get to that maximize 100 pitches, you want to go deeper into games. That's the whole key about being a starting pitcher. 
yeah, I'm old school. When I took the ball, I wanted to go nine innings. Don't mm-hmm. take the ball away from me unless I'm backing up third or backing up home. That's the mentality we got to get young pitchers to think about. I loved what you said. Give me 21 outs. If you can cut it down to outs instead of innings yep. and you start dissecting it and you look on your iPad or what I did the first time around, what I'm going to do the second time around, that's how you get longevity in a game to know what you're throwing at certain times of the game. That's what I like about Brian Price. I know he wants it to go longer, but the analytic numbers hold him out all the time. Analytics are great but let's watch this guy pitch every game and let him go deep in games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's gotta be the, the eye test, right? I mean, you got, you got to know what you're seeing with your eyes and not what is being typed into your computer. I mean, that's, that's the big difference and, and philosophical difference. I think that we will see with Buster. You sound Posey. old, Walter. That's the old way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a little, I'm a little old school. I'm a little old school, Bill, but, uh, but yeah, no, it was really interesting to see to just to hear uh, Buster Posey just just kind of throw that out there as far as what the, his philosophy will be as far as he knows and he understands going back to the championship years he knows and understands how to um, how to have a starting pitcher out there and it gives you just a different edge when you know every single guy in the rotation can go six or seven innings and I, yeah the 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 handcuffs need to come off the restrictions mm-hmm. need to come off you need to be allowed to go out there and give it your all every fifth day. And I would love to see what that variation of a Hayden Birdsong, of a Kyle Harrison, of a of a Carson Wisenhut, who, right. who has been restricted in the in the mm-hmm. minor league system as well. You just want to see what that growth can potentially be. And Kerry, I think we're going to see that with this new regime. Yeah, I'm really excited about it because you mentioned Carson Wisenhunt. He's someone who we need to see more of. Landon Roop is someone who we need to see a lot more of. Bill brought up the name Tristan Beck when Keaton Wynn comes back and is healthy next year. I want to see these guys at AAA Sacramento trying to get to seven, really trying to get to 21 outs. That's got to be the target for these guys. And here's the difference. I think in the past it's been, let's give you 60 pitches and see what you can do in 60 pitches. I think if you give people a number of outs to get to, then they're more economical and efficient with the way that they're throwing. Then they're thinking about the game in a different way. And so if you shoot for 21, maybe you end up at 18. But if you shoot for 60 pitches, you're always going to end up at 60 pitches and you don't grow from having the same target every time out. You know, one of the things we heard Buster talk about were memories. He talked Mm -hmm. about certain players, Madison Bumgarner, Matt Kane, he goes on and on, Lincecum. Do you think you could take the ball away from Bumgarner after Absolutely. 70 pitches after five innings? <laughs> do you think you could do that with Matt Kane nope. or even Lincecum? And I think that's what he's grasping here. We want to go back to the time when these guys competed in 10, 12, and 14. And sure, that's 10 years ago. But the mentality that Buster's bringing in is that mentality of how we get to that point. And to push people, I loved what Kerry said. Logan Webb, I want to get to 200 innings. Hey, you know what? That's what we all did. That was uh, how many years ago? I don't know. That's when I had dark hair. But, you know, that's the mentality as a starting pitcher. That's what you want. Give me the ball. Let me go as far as I can. And if I got a shutout going, I want to finish it. How do you take people out of no hitters, Kerry? How do you do that? How do you take them out of the game? Because you got a pitch count. I got a no hitter going. Seriously. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, 148 pitches for Tim Lincecum. That that's the total I remember. I remember mm-hmm. 148. Yeah, that was that was incredible time. Hopefully, uh, we're able to see these guys get stretched out a little bit because yeah, that, that's that's how the, this young core uh, moving forward. That's how they'll develop, and yep. and, and it also translates to uh, to hitting to, to getting at bats. I mean, you start looking at the the I would say mismanagement of Marco Luciano. We don't have to dive straight into it, but uh, he gets called up and he gets a couple of bats, and then he gets sent back down, and it's just this, this elevator. This it, it's just it, it was a terrible system. So you'd like to see. Uh, the young guys get their opportunities and that goes for pitchers and it goes for hitters as well. But uh, let's kind of stay with the, the theme of pitching, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked a lot about the, the starters that the giants have and prospect of the, of the rotation of what it could be minus Blake Snell. We'll talk about Blake Snell and, and, and that situation uh, here in a little bit on rounding third and King. I'm joined by Bill Lasky and Kerry Crowley. Well, let's take a look at the, 
let's take a look at the at the at the bullpen, right? I mean, one of the big stories this season, twenty twenty four, was Ryan Walker and his emergence. I mean, last year he really had a a coming out party. He was one of those reliable guys. He was opening games, and he was pretty much the the Swiss Army knife for the the Giants. Whenever whatever they needed him to do, that's what he did. And now you look at what he can do at the back end of the bullpen, and that whole dynamic has changed. So Ryan Walker him being the reliable force for the Giants in the bullpen, what does that necessarily mean for Camilo Duvall, who kind of fizzled out a little bit and had command issues? And and uh, what what does the future look like for Camilo? What would you think, Kerry? Yeah, this is difficult because I think relievers are so fickle. You, you never know what you're going to get season over season. That's why I'm never a fan of just bringing back a, the same bullpen. I, I always think you want to bring in a number of new arms, see what you've got in your farm system, see who comes to spring training with some new life on the ball, has learned a new pitch in spring training, what they can unlock. My whole goal for the Giants this offseason, at the beginning of Buster Posey's tenure, is the Giants should look to have Camilo Doval throw in the sixth or the seventh inning next year. And that should be because they've brought in so much talent and they have so many guys ready to take down the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, that there's just incredible competition taking place at spring training. And so that's not to say that Camilo couldn't throw the ninth inning. That's not to say that Camilo couldn't regain that closer job and show us that 103 miles an hour truly is different. And he has that special capability. It's just to say there needs to be more competition in the bullpen. And I think that Ryan Walker did a tremendous job providing him that competition this year. The Giants' decision was very easy when Camilo struggled to go to Ryan Walker because he was so good. Bill, Tyler Rogers held down the eighth inning, and he's done it for six seasons now. Tyler Rogers is the epitome of someone who's consistent in that bullpen. There's a few blowups here and there every season, but that's true of relievers who pitch in 70-plus games a year. I want to see six or seven guys who enter next season with the capability to take down the eighth or the ninth because the trickle-down effect is you get better pitchers in the sixth and the seventh inning next year. You know, one of the things I think is the strength of the Giants is their bullpen. Mm-hmm. And you look at young arms, Eric Miller. Yeah. And we we'll talk about Ryan Walker, Sean Jelly, Spencer Bivens, Tristan Beck, Randy Rodriguez. These guys are all first-year guys. Yeah. And you got Eric Miller in over 70 games, Tyler Rogers in 77 games, Ryan Walker in 76. I don't know if they would change this, but I would love to see some of these guys go two innings instead of one inning out, one inning out, one inning out. I would like to see the middle relief, just like Kerry was talking about Camillo in the sixth, seventh, or eighth inning. Get these guys spread out a little bit. Yeah. Taylor Rogers, I was talking to Walter about this. It really, really, I was looking at numbers, Kerry. Right handers, hitters, hitters hit 206 off them. Lefties hit 289 off them. And you, I mean, these numbers tell it. And this is Taylor Rogers, a lefty. Yeah. So I think when you start looking at the matchups and things of this magnitude, put Taylor Rogers in a two inning stint. There are guys that you can put in that middle of the pack that are, that can do one or two innings. I don't know if that'll change in baseball. That seems like 30 teams are still doing the one inning in, one inning out. But I think the depth of the bullpen, I really believe, was the strength of 2024. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so let, let's let's kind of switch gears to the offense, right? I mean, that, that was one of the big things that everyone kind of looked to as – as it was lacking and at points it was anemic to, you know the, the 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 giants just the offense was was non-existent at, at mm-hmm. points where uh it, it just didn't resemble anything of a major league lineup to where uh but now you see like guys like Elliot Ramos you see guys like Luis Matos who who came up and and had a phenomenal what f- five days at at the big league level and he just went absolutely berserk i mean how, how many how many rbis did he have that series against the i think it was like 11 right. yeah. 11 in two days and 19 and yeah. in, in in like a series or something like that it was just it was incredible stuff for luis matos but uh he's one of those guys that's kind of on the fence you're still trying to see what you have there with luis matos so maybe we'll we'll get to see him in uh is he going to be going to to, to fall winter ball. yeah no, winter, they'll, winter, they'll probably, i'll play winter ball. yeah so so we'll have to see uh, his progression there, but Luis Matos and and uh, Marco Luciano and, and Tyler Fitzgerald and just all these young guys that did get an opportunity uh, here. Just where do you, where do you see that trajectory going for a lot of these young hitters that they did get a little bit of opportunities and some more than others? But uh, who do you look forward to 
kind of getting their opportunity going into 2025 next year, Kerry? Yeah, the first name that comes to mind isn't someone who's made his debut at the major league level, but he is the name that's on every Giants fan's mind, and that's Bryce Eldridge. I think by the middle of next season, we'll get a good look at Bryce Eldridge in the middle of a major league lineup, and I think he has the real potential to be that special homegrown player the Giants have been waiting for for a long time. Now, with that being said, I think the challenge for the Giants is determining and having the scouts who Buster Posey hires, having the general manager who Buster Posey hires, determining who they keep and who they trade because there's a lot of young players on the 40-man roster right now, Bill. They can't keep all of these guys. You, you can't really have an outfield where you've got Mike Yastrzemski, Luis Matos, Wade Meckler, Grant McRae, and Jung Hoo Lee. Someone's got to be the odd man out. So is it Meckler in a trade? Is it McCray in a trade after what he showed from an athleticism and a speed standpoint and dropping the power a little bit during the month of September? That was nice to see. I think the Giants are going to have some 40-man roster bloat this offseason. You're going to see a few two-for-one deals where they package mm -hmm. together two prospects and get a major league player in return. Or they package together three guys and get two guys back just because the, the, the sure numbers that they have right now in the organization, the highest levels of the organization. So does Marco Luciano have a place in the future San Francisco Giants? I don't think so right now, but where is his future at? That's to be determined. And it's on Buster Posey, the people that he hires to make sure that the Giants are getting good players in return when they do swing these type of trades, Bill. You know, there is a lot of youth, you know, when you look at Matos Luciano, I mean, so many young guys are getting an opportunity. Schmidt, you could throw in there. And I really look at what Matos did in that month of May when you're talking about all the numbers. And then all of a sudden, Jung Hu Lee gets hurt and they mm -hmm. don't have a leadoff hitter. Mm -hmm. And of course, Matos jumps in there and his batting average went straight yeah. down. It was a position in the lineup that he didn't do. He never did it. And I don't think he really reacted as the first time doing it, a leadoff hitter. He still swung hard. He wasn't watching pitches. And I think that blew up his season. I really did. Yeah. And then they send him down. And, you know, we talk about the yo-yo or the, you know, I-80 trip back and forth. It mentally drains you. It doesn't matter what you do physically. It mentally drains you because you're at the top of the list. Now, all of a sudden, you're back down in Sacramento trying to figure it back out. It is difficult for a 22-year-old, 23-year-old, 24-year-old to understand what's going on. That's what's going to change here with Buster Posey because as a player, you understand that. If you give up perfect opportunity for these guys, then you know, hey, you can't hit a slider. Go down and work on a slider. You're getting a fastball. You're elevated fastball. You're swinging through. That's why these young players, you look at Luciano. You're supposed to be a big-time hitter. You say, hey, you traded Solaire to put him as a DH. He DH twice, and he doesn't play anymore. Yeah. You read it. You hear it, but you don't do it. These things are going to be changed. There's no question about it. But I'm right there with Kerry. I think there isn't enough room for all these guys, and they're going to have to do something with them. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. And Marco Luciano heading down to uh, to winter ball and and going to be getting the corner outfield. It's going to be uh, really interesting to see if that is a fit for the Giants or if that is kind of a showcase to yep. uh, to showcase where where he can be elsewhere uh, on the field. So we talked a lot about young players, right? I mean, the Giants have a ton of them. We saw a lot of them in 2024. Uh, but one guy that kind of captivated the, the hearts and souls of Giants fans was Matt Chapman, the Willie Mack Award winner. And he he is sticking around for a, 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 good, a good chunk of time, six-year extension. And that was a courtesy to Buster Posey, pushing it across mm -hmm. the finish line. So hopefully you get to see uh, that translate into further negotiations when we talk about Blake Snell and, and other potential free agents uh, that are, are the Giants are going to be targeting this year. But just how important do you think that, that Matt Chapman – is to this Giants organization kind of being named the the focal point, the centerpiece of what this team, what this organization is trying to accomplish here, Kerry? Well, Walter, when you first started asking this question, you said the name Matt Chapman, and Bill and I both smiled at the same time. <laughs> and this goes back to the point that Buster Posey said on Tuesday's yeah. introductory press conference. We're in the memory-making business. And one of the best memories from the 2024 season was the game in New York against the Mets, a wild mm -hmm. affair where Matt Chapman has the barehanded impossible play 
and we all remember it. A 2024 season where the Giants win 80 games, and you remember one of them because he created that indelible moment with his contributions at the end of that ball game. So that right there tells you everything you need to know about Matt Chapman and his future as a leader in the Giants organization. He's a memory maker, and it's on the Giants, it's on Buster Posey to surround him with other memory makers. I think that's the difference, Bill. When you see someone 150 times a season, like Giants fans got to see Matt Chapman, there's more opportunities for those memories to be created. A lot of people will be buying Matt Chapman jerseys this off season. And it's the first time they've been able to buy jerseys of a position player, probably since Buster Posey donned the uniform for the San Francisco Giants. And I think that that's really special. And so it, it's hard to put into words what the memory makers do because you think of moments. And I think that when you have guys who create moments, you have a winning team. Well, I'll ask you both this question. When was the last time a Giants player played in 154 games? <laughs> Hunter Pence, 2014? Yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. But not recently, 154 yeah. games, 575 at-bats. 600 at-bats is what, real, when you're playing every game, that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more. 39 doubles, two triples, and 27 home yeah. runs. That tells you in the offensive side, I don't believe he's a number four hitter, five hitter, maybe a three hitter, but he was working the four spot. Mm -hmm. And for him to do that, I still think on the offensive side, he did extremely well. Don't forget about stolen bases. This guy had 15 stolen bases. Yeah. So <laughs> I think his speed, I think everybody, Bob Melvin knew about it. Matt Williams knew about it, but I think the audience, the fans didn't know about it, but he was pretty quick. I yeah. think he is that building block. You hear Patrick Bailey, you hear Fitzgerald saying he's a leader. He calms us down. He fires us up. Of course, the referee outfit after every game. <laughs> basketball. Those are the kind of guys you want in that locker room to loosen it up, have fun with it. Yeah. I'm glad he's here. I'm I'm looking forward to watching him in the next six years. Yeah, you talk about the, those uh, stolen base numbers. I remember early on in the season where the Giants were one of the last teams. I think they were the last team to record a stolen base uh, at the beginning yeah. of the season. And uh, I had someone call in on the Giants warm-up show. They're like, Matt Chapman, he can steal base. And because and they wanted the Giants to steal more bases, I was just like, who's going to do that? <laughs> who's, who's on this roster that is currently going to do that? And then what does Matt Chapman do the next day? He steals two, two stolen bases. I'm just like, oh, well, yep. They were, they were right about See, Matt Chapman. He can do right. everything. Yeah. All the callers are All right. All the callers are right, man. But uh, we're talking about the, the offseason. Let's switch, we'll switch gears here a little bit into the offseason. Right, because mm -hmm. Buster Posey does have his work uh, cut out for him going into this roster construction of what uh, the Giants need to acquire. I mean, we talk about the offense, we talk about some uh, some additions potentially to the to the rotation. I mean, you do have a, a rotation currently as it's constructed with Logan Webb, with Kyle Harrison, with Hayden Birdsong, uh, Robbie Ray, and then other. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you don't really know. I mean, there's other candidates in Landon Roop and Carson Wisenhunt and and Tristan Beck, Mason Black, all those guys. That could have consideration but um when you look to kind of right now i guess he was he was in the building in blake snell and that was a uh a, a, a big piece of farhan's offseason spending last year and it is anticipated i don't think that we have any confirmation yet but it's anticipated that he's going to opt out of yeah. of, of his contract um so he will become a free agent and test the waters do you both both of you guys, do you feel that Blake Snell is a top priority for the Giants going into this offseason? Being that he was, uh, um, I mean, he pitched to his to his the back of his baseball card down the second second half of the year. Do you think that he would be the top priority for the Giants moving forward? And being that he was a former Giant and 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 he was already in San Francisco, and is there that kind of love affair with Blake Snell and the city of San Francisco? Does he want to be here? But Kerry, uh, would you think that he is the the, the priority going into the offseason for the Giants? I'll put it like this: I think he's part of a group of pitchers who are a top priority for the San Francisco Giants, and that includes Max Freed, and it includes Corbin Burns. They need to emerge from this offseason with one member of that trio, and maybe 
They don't need a member of that trio. If they can swing a trade for Sonny Gray of the St. Louis Cardinals, who are going to be taking a step back. He's got that front end potential. But to me, those are the three pitchers, Snell, Burns, and Freed, who can separate themselves on this free agent market. I see Sonny Gray available via trade. I see Jack Flaherty. They're both kind of a tier lower for me, but the Giants really need someone from that tier one group, Bill, in my opinion. So Snell, absolutely a priority, but his name belongs in the conversation with two others who are part of that group. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I don't think that's the first guy they're going to go after. He's yeah. going to be in discussions. He will be in contract. Well, how much does he want? But we all always have to know this. There's going to be other teams like the L.A. Dodgers that are hurting in a starting rotation. Mm -hmm. There are other teams like the Cubs and, and some other teams, maybe even the Braves. They do have a lot of money, and I think the Dodgers might be, you know, courting him right off the bat with some bigger numbers. Yeah, I think the Giants will talk to him. And I know Walter and I talked about Sasaki from Japan, who oh, yeah. who's gonna he's gonna opt out and, and jump in. That's somebody they should look at, something of that magnitude. Uh pitching is a priority, but again, I still think position players they're gonna go after first. We talked about it earlier about middle infield, a solid bat, but I don't think they need a home run bat. Mm -hmm. I think they need a contact hitter, a few of them. Because as we all know, Oracle Park's tough to hit home runs in. But I think if you can get a gap guy, an average guy, and start adding them to this lineup, that's where I'd like it. Yeah, yeah I think they definitely need to address the offense in in that regard that, that you just said, Bill, is, is you have to have someone that hits it from foul pole to foul pole. They yep. have to be able to spread the ball, uh, I mean, not, not rely on the long ball like we see so many hitters uh, in today's game of baseball. But a, a big thing is athleticism. Mm -hmm. Athleticism and and obviously defenders and, and everything like that. You want to have a good defense, but as long as you play fundamental baseball and you have speed and you're athletic, I think that that plays phenomenal in this ballpark because we remember in, in the years that they won their, their championships in that it wasn't necessarily a, um, you know, they, they weren't out homering everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, they were finding ways to score, to score runs. And I think that if you get back to constructing your roster to play to this ballpark and use it more as a, an advantage, as a, as opposed to a hindrance, I think then the giants can, can excel in that, in that regard, Kerry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the guys who comes to mind right away, Hassan Kim, he's close with yeah. Jung Hoo Lee. He's someone who has that kind of, you know, uh, hit to contact ability, that speed ability, and he plays great fundamental defense at both middle infield position, shortstop and second base. And so if you're Buster Posey, you're looking at how can we be different than the 2023 and 2024 San Francisco Giants? What can we do? Hassan Kim coming off a major injury as well. He just had season ending shoulder surgery for the San Diego Pottery. So you're looking at someone who could be available on a one-year deal. That's you know, if you want to give Tyler Fitzgerald an opportunity to win the job, maybe Fitzgerald's your shortstop, Kim's your second baseman, you can flip it. There's a number of different ways to go there if you don't land, say, a Willie Adamas or someone else. But I think that athleticism is a huge part of this entire equation. You know, one of the things that all three of us have talked about in many shows and things that they have to adjust to, runners in scoring position, yep. strikeouts, but call strike three. Those are things that they're going to have to make adjustments to change the mental approach to runners in scoring position. You look at every top tier team in the wild card and, and waiting in the, the division winners. You look at the runners in scoring position. These guys are awesome. And yeah. look at the strikeouts. The Giants had over 1400 strikeouts. You look at those teams. They're not even half there. Yeah. So I think as we all talked about a contact hitter, putting mm -hmm. the ball in play, choking up all the basic things that get the ball in play. I think that's number one priority. Yeah, I would like to see uh, one of my guys I've been, I've been talking about. He's not necessarily athletic, um, but trade trade for Vlad Jr. I, I would I would love to see that. I would love to see him in, in orange and black. I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I, I just love his game. I remember seeing him hit his first two home runs in a major league uh, game, and I was against the Giants back in, I think it was 2019, 2018, sitting down that left field or third, third base line. Uh, he'd, be, he'd be a good addition, but, you know, I, I, you, I, I, you might, know, I might do. be, I Walter, might be a little, little too have, out there. Yeah, you do have some great first basements that are on free agent. Pete yeah. Alonzo, yeah, Paul Goldschmidt, yeah, Christian Walker, yeah, from the Diamondbacks. Yeah. And then we go back to what Kerry says. What about Bryce Aldrich? If you mm -hmm. sign yeah. one of these guys to a two or three year contract, then where is he going to be? Just a I DH? Know. Yeah, 
that's going to be the way in, yeah. way out type of yeah. thing of how much money they want to spend for a big free agent power hitter. But then you got to look at Eldridge, who's your next upcoming 20 year old superstar like Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Bill, about uh, maybe 10 years ago, people thought that way about me. And then, then they realized I was more of a platoon guy. <laughs> well, I think that is a, that, that's a good, that's a good spot to end it. I think that's a good spot to end it. Thank you both. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Obviously we didn't get to where uh, the giants wanted to go, but it was a lot of fun. I know I, I enjoyed uh, the shows on the warm up shows and, and, and doing round and throwing King every single weekend. And I know I've had you both on separate, Separately at different points of the season, but it was a uh, it was a lot of fun just to kind of sit down, talk ball with with uh, you two, and and I look forward to it next year. Yeah, we can do it more. I'm all for it. But always enjoy walking, we're, we're talking to Carrie, not walking, talking <laughs> to Carrie. And uh, uh, Walter, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. And I'll, I'll say this: an 80 win season is more challenging than a team that loses 100 games. It's more challenging than a team that wins 100 games. But I got to give both of you credit. Every weekend you came up with something to talk about, keep the fans engaged. And I had such a joy listening to you. I'm a fan of KMBR. I'm a fan of your guys' shows. And when I'm not on the air, I'm listening. And I'm so grateful to have spent this season with both of you. All right. Well, that does it for Rounding Third and King on KMBR 1045 and 680. The sports leader, Bill Lasky, Walter Ecotaseta, Kerry Crowley. We're going to wrap it up. And you guys have a good one. We'll talk to you next season. All right.